Every year we have our Vision Sunday where we talk about kind of where we've been the past year and where we see God leading us in the new year. And I'm going to say a few things about that and then Don's going to come up toward the end and say a few more things about that. But before we go there, I want to spend just a few minutes sharing a little bit of a, I guess I'd call it a devotional with you. Uh, I'm going to have you turn to Exodus 3. We've been in Exodus now for a few months and the study has been for me really the highlight of my year, to be honest with you. Uh, going through kind of spring, summer, just found myself wrestling with different aspects of, of my life and, and then coming into the book of Exodus for the first time, really, I've, I mean, I've read the book and had to, gosh, had to write papers on it in seminary and everything else, but just to come to the book of Exodus for my own personal devotions and to to see God, looking for God, His glory, looking for Christ in the book of Exodus, written and recording history that took place thousands of years before Christ even came on the scene. But just coming to this book and looking for Jesus and gospel implications has been just a huge encouragement to me. It's been one of the, the best studies of my, my life, to be honest with you. I've just really enjoyed it and I've enjoyed sharing the messages with you guys and then talking with some of you about what we've been learning. And so I found myself drawn back to the book of Exodus uh, last few days when I was thinking about what I was going to say this morning, I kept thinking about where, where do I want to go and so much about our understanding of the gospel and so much about this idea of real life grace we've already talked about. I've got tons of messages and things I've written and things we've shared, whether in Sunday school or sermons, but I found myself drawn back to Exodus. And um, before, I, before I read this section in chapter 3, I, I want you to think with me for a minute about, about your own life, and I want you to think about whatever it is that you would say is probably the, the greatest challenge in your life right now. And I know for most of you, that there's a whole list of things. But what would you say is like the greatest challenge? What troubles you the most? What do you find yourself tossing and turning in bed throughout the night, not sleeping, thinking about? What do you find yourself waking up worried about or going through your day? And your mind just kind of keeps going back to that thing. Or that, is it a relationship, maybe it's a relational challenge of some kind, a conflict you're stuck in. Maybe it's a physical disability, something, some pain you're living with, or a diagnosis you've received that's been hard. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's a financial setback. I, I don't know what it is, but I just want you to kind of conjure that to mind. What, what is that thing? What's made 2018 difficult for you? Or maybe just the last few weeks or months difficult for you? What is the one thing, if you could take it, Let's see, if this, let's see if this works. If you could take it and kind of turn it into a physical object, stick it in a box, tape the box up, throw it in your trunk, drive it in the middle of nowhere, and drop it off and then just leave it there and drive back to your life, what would you want to just get rid of? Wow. I didn't expect all the, yeah, stress, anxiety. And, and I would imagine, I'm not going to do this to you, Mikkel, but if I... If I were to ask you what specifically, you could, <laughs> if you could wrap David up, stick him in a box, tape it up, drop him off in the middle of Montana somewhere or something. Dave, we'd come get you, man. Some of us would come. We'd come get you. So without, without uh, calling out who that person is or what that situation is in your life, just think about it. Again, it, it, it's troubling to you something you would not pick for your, for your life. You wouldn't want to go through whatever it is. You, if you could, you would physically push it or him or her away so that you could get on with your life, so that you could find some contentment, so that you could find some peace, so that you could find some joy. I mean, what would it be? Okay, now here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to think about with me. I want you to connect this dot with me or these dots with me, okay? What if pushing that person away or that circumstance away, what if pushing that away is actually the equivalent of pushing God away? What if that very circumstance or person, whatever it is, what if that is in your life 
by God design? What if that's exactly what he has for you? What if he intends to use that in your life to draw you to himself? To teach you things about himself, about his glory, about his greatness, about his, listen to this, about his heart, the way he thinks. See, we we were talking even earlier when I was down there, we were talking about how we, we all have patterns in our thinking that are unhealthy. We believe lies. We experience misery as a result of that. We experience enslavement as a result of that, of all kinds, whether we're enslaved to our own anxiety, enslaved to our own anger, enslaved to our own greed, you name it. I mean, what if God has things about himself and his heart and his joy and his peace and his freedom that he wants to teach you by going through whatever it is you're, you're going through? What if he wants to show you some things? We were looking at, the other day, uh, Jill and I were looking back at some pictures. We were able to go to Disney World with my in-laws who were here visiting for the holidays. Uh, last February, it was February, right, or January? It was right in there. Anyway, uh, it's almost been a year, and man, we had a great time down there. I mean, just leaving wet, soggy Washington and flying to sunny Florida it itself was fantastic, and then all the other things. And, and I, we were looking at pictures, and this is one picture with me, Jenna, on my shoulders, and we're at the Magic Kingdom watching the fireworks display, which is amazing, one of the, probably the best I've ever seen. And in the picture, I just, as I'm looking at it, I remembered what it was like kind of pointing out and just showing Jenna, hey, look at those amazing lights and the, all the things projected there on the castle. And all. I mean, it's just this awe-inspiring experience and how pleasurable it was for me as her dad to show her that, for her to experience that. And the other day when we were looking at those pictures, I thought of the heart of God, our Father, who delights to show us things that are amazing, wonderful things, awe-inspiring things about himself. That's what we were created for. That's what he's up to. And, and it's really in the hardships of life where we're equipped to or prepared to see those things most clearly. So, so Exodus 3, I don't want to belabor this because we've, we've kind of circled back several times to these earlier portions of Exodus, but let me just read verses 6 through 8. This is God speaking to Moses about his plan to deliver his people from Egyptian bondage. It says, He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings, So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'll stop there. Prior to this point, the Israelites were in Goshen, which was, Goshen was an area, basically the most fertile area in all of Egypt. They were in the prime, sort of prime real estate area. And for hundreds of years, they had lived there and were flourishing. They were doing quite well. Uh, We would say today they're they're fat and happy in Goshen. And in the beginning of Exodus, we find God disrupting their sense of happiness or whatever they were experiencing in their prosperity is the disruption because a new pharaoh uh, comes into power and he begins oppressing the Israelites Instead of all this privilege they had in Goshen, he he puts them to work. He enslaves them. He's basically torturing them with hard labor. And then because of his own insecurity, he issues this edict that all all the newborn sons should be killed. All the Hebrew sons should be killed so that none of them would rise up, so they wouldn't be continue multiplying and prospering because he was afraid of their power. So you can imagine living under that and how terrible that would be and how for some of them they must have been scratching their heads thinking what what went wrong here things were going so well and all of a sudden things are not going well and humanly what we would pick would be the the prosperous times the easy times the the times when things are going our way and we feel like life is good (laughs) 
We're fat and happy. We want that in this world. But God, by design, had something different for them. He had for them to go through this suffering. And he says here, this is by his design. He says, look, I, I'm, I'm their God. I've been their God. That's why he mentions their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Going way back, these are my people. We would say today, he, 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 he knows you. He, you belong to him. He has plans for you. He takes interest in you. And he says, I've seen their affliction, given heed to their cry. I know their suffering. And, and in verse 8, and I want you just to notice verse 8 where he says, So, I have come down to deliver them. He says, I'm, I'm going down there. And he meets with Moses and there's the burning bush and then he just continues to reveal himself. And, and it says, as we read, and we'll see uh, in, in weeks ahead here as we work through our uh, sermon series, we'll see where, where God is at work hardening Pharaoh's heart, kind of prolonging this whole ordeal, just keeps it going, dr- sort of stringing them along. And again, humanly, as we would be, they were frustrated by that, wanted just, hey, let's just get this over with. If we're going to be liberated, let's just have it already. But you see God just keeping it going with the plagues, and then he parts the Red Sea, and they get through, and then they're in the wilderness wanderings, and things are good, then things are not so good. They have, uh, they have enough water, then they don't have enough water. They have enough food, then they don't have enough food. And it's just this long ordeal. And God says he's doing that to reveal himself. He, he, he deliberately, by design, is multiplying his signs, his signs and wonders. He wants to impress them with himself. He wants to show them things about himself. Remember I said earlier, whatever that is in your life that bothers you the most, if you could just take it and get rid of it, you would. What if that's there by design? What if God wants to show you things about himself that require you going through what you're going through. He reveals his desire to meet us in our mess, not only by his coming down in Moses' time, but then in the future, from there, past for us, but when he comes through Jesus in the incarnation, when he touches down in in human flesh to live in our midst, to experience human suffering, human temptations, all of it. We read John chapter 1. The law was revealed through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So here's God taking upon himself real flesh, Living here, again, experiencing what we're experiencing. Uh, 1 John, same author, the Apostle John. 1 John says, hey, we are eyewitnesses. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. He was physically here. And even in Sunday school, we were marveling over the fact that the, the Greek gods and pagan gods, I mean, they were always at a distance. But Jesus gets close. He lives here. He's incarnate. And what that tells us is he's not afraid to roll up his sleeves, to get dirty, to get close to sinners like you, sinners like like me. As I said earlier, he I mean he he selects, as uh, Michelle pointed out, essentially he picks his own genealogy and he includes all these messed up, like obviously messed up people. I mean, there are people who are not as obviously messed up and there are ones who are very obviously messed up. <laughs> and that's the people he picks. And it says something about his love for me and for you. And so now kind of transitioning we use this um, term a lot, real life grace, and, and we hope to do more with that. And we, we, we like that. We like that name, that kind of ministry name, which I hope will come to fruition, that ministry name, because it speaks of, of Jesus meeting us in real life. Not, not the fantasy life, not what we would want, but in real life. 
And one of the things we're convinced of here is that as much as humanly we want to kind of extricate ourselves and get out of those adverse circumstances, that's where we're actually taught to know God. That's where we see him. That's where we come to understand him. That's where we come to experience some of the freedom of his thinking, his truth. The enslavement in Egypt, all representative of life without God. Me as my own Pharaoh, me as my own king, me as my own authority, me living autonomously. And and here's God saying, look, I'm here to show you amazing things about my character, what I'm like. And when you know this truth, this truth sets you free. So that's what he's up to. And he does it in these real life situations. So I want to read to you something uh, I wrote recently, thinking more about this, this phrase, real life grace, this term, real life grace. And this will kind of help us moving forward. And I don't know, we might at some point have this on our website. But I was thinking through how this is kind of our distinctive. You know, there's, there's a lot of different churches in the area. And if you, if you go down their statement of faith, they're going to be probably really similar. Believe in the, the inspiration of Scripture and the Trinity and the full deity of Christ and the virgin birth and salvation by grace through faith. And you go down the list and those things will be the same and, and pretty uniform by comparison. But, but what we feel like kind of sets us apart in our identity as a church is this idea of real life grace. A God who meets us on the ground. A God who meets us in the mess. A God who is at work in those parts of our lives. Relentlessly invading our lives. Even when our tendency inside is to push him away, he just keeps coming and coming and coming for us. So here's what I wrote. We believe in real life grace. What good is Christianity when what you hope to experience as a follower of Jesus hasn't happened or when your worst nightmare has come true. The divorce has been finalized. The children have abandoned the faith and started using drugs. The prayers for healing have gone unanswered. Your cancer is terminal. You're addicted to pornography. Still. You don't have joy or peace. You're filled with fear and frustration. In honest moments, you can admit that deep down you are disappointed with God maybe even angry with him for what he's allowing to happen. You gave him your life, and it's falling apart. Now what? Contrary to fantasies many of us have entertained, becoming a Christian is no guarantee of a charmed, easy, or sin-free life. In fact, I'll stop here. It's just a parenthetical note. In my experience, I've been a Christian for a long time, and have been in different sort of circles or subsections of Christianity and have moved around the country and lived in different areas and been on staff at different churches, big churches, small churches. I've had a lot of experience with evangelical Christianity. And I will tell you that this fantasy version of it is pervasive. I'm not going to blame anybody. I'm going to say it's just, it's just humanly, it's natural. It's what some call the theology of glory. Okay, bigger, better, upward and onward. Now that I'm a Christian, okay, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe Jesus had this sort of shameful, dirty lineage. And maybe I even have some past baggage. But now Christianity is about sort of digging out of all that, leaving all that behind. And one of the things that we're convinced of here as a church is that until we're home, that ugly flesh is with us. And there's a simultaneous reality that we are both dead in trespasses and sins, but also alive because we're loved by God through Jesus and his spirit lives within us. That those are simultaneously true. The big Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator, which means simultaneously righteous and sinner. That's what we believe. And, um, and unfortunately, I think there's a lot of teaching out there, and I've certainly been guilty of thinking this way and teaching this way, that just sort of has people chasing this carrot of just, okay, things are going to be glorious, things are going to be better. It's, it's about, again, this sort of prospering, whether that's some kind of material prospering, the obvious health, wealth, prosperity, gospel stuff, or the, the more subtle version, which is just, well, if you, if you practice these spiritual disciplines and if you walk with God, then you really get your sin taken care of, you'll clean yourself up, your family will be nice and clean and tidy, and everything will go well for you. I mean, these, just these messages that we are naturally drawn to, 
Let me keep reading. Contrary to fantasies many of us have entertained, becoming a Christian is no guarantee of a charmed, easy, or sin-free life. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's a promise, and we live in the reality of it every day. Life is hard for all of us. We experience pain, disappointment, and conflict of all kinds in this fallen world. No matter how hard we try to fix things, they still seem broken. The more we work at getting our stuff together, the more it seems to fall apart. The harder we try to repair relationships, the more distant people become. We often struggle and strive only to end up exhausted and empty. We believe that God's grace impacts us most powerfully in these difficulties of real life. In these painful providences, God reveals that he is not a demanding taskmaster, but a merciful savior. He is not disappointed or angry with us. He understands our weaknesses, delights to meet us in our mess. He knows that true hope for our souls is not found in our efforts, but in his grace alone. We stumble and fall and fail, but he still loves us. And he is active in all of our lives, using the hardships we face to open our hearts to the healing of his real life grace. The healing that comes not as we somehow escape all those hard, painful things, but as we experience God in the midst of them, as God opens our eyes and shows us things about himself, shows us things about his love, you, you think about maybe for, I would guess probably for a lot of you when I said earlier, hey, think of whatever that one thing, that pressing thing. I would guess that for most of you, if not all of you, there was some relational component to that where you feel hurt or betrayed by somebody or abandoned by somebody. Those types of experiences, which are the hardest types of experiences we have, have a lot to tell us about the character of a God who says, even at your worst moments, I never abandon you. The person you thought loved you the most, they betrayed you, they hurt you. And here's a God who says, look, I have shown my love for you by laying my life down for you. My love for you, God says, brought me to the place of my own death. You want to know how much I love you? Look at the cross. Look what baby Jesus grew up to experience. Look at how his life ended. Took your curse upon himself. That is love. To set you free. Mercy as he looks at your affliction, as he looks at your enslavement and your suffering. God wants to reveal that to you. He wants you to see that more clearly. He he wants you to know him. That's what you were created for. Nothing else in this world is going to ever satisfy your heart or ever amaze you in the ways that you're longing to be amazed. Even the most impressive things we see, even that amazing fireworks display back at Disney World a year ago, in that moment, there's still like this is, wow, this is this amazing thing, but it's almost like a dimension missing. It's awesome, but yet it's like, well, it could be more awesome. All these kind of traces or pointers maybe we could say that 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 point us beyond this world to say you're made for bigger better thing i i can't even imagine what it's going to be like when we're in heaven if i'm that impressed at a fireworks show that i think they have like every single night there which must cost a fortune which is why they how much do they charge us that's why they charge us like outrageous amounts of money to go to their theme park but even imagine god when we're home in heaven, all the things he will show us, including we'll see his heart perfectly at that time, perfect love, perfect acceptance, perfect sense of belonging, perfect sense of security. I mean, it's going to be just mind-blowing. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be true freedom. And so in the meantime, while we're here, he's just meeting us in these messy places saying, hey, don't, don't sink your roots down here <laughs> too deeply because this isn't your home. This isn't what it's all about. This is not what you exist for. So he's working, working, working in our lives. And last thing I'll say about this before I have Don come up and say some things is, uh, and I wrote about this as well, and I won't read it all to you, but 
what we've been experiencing for the last few years, really, and what we hope to experience more of is, is a real-life grace community. So what we just talked about, God meeting us in the mess and keeping us going while we're here until we're home, he, he knows that we struggle. God understands that we don't see him with our naked eyes. Unlike the Apostle John, we didn't see him, hear him, touch him. We, we didn't. It, again, if, I've said this before, but if you tell me you did, I, just don't tell me you did see him, hear him, touch him, because that creeps me out a little bit. But God understands. That's difficult for us. So here's what he does. He gives us the church. He gives us one another. He gives us an environment in which we can share together in this safety we have with him. I I said earlier, he he sees us clearly. He sees the ugliest parts of us, and yet he doesn't abandon us. He loves us. The mercy only wells up within him when he sees those ugly parts of us. And then he gives us a context of other human beings who are flawed, who are living with those simultaneous realities, but yet who themselves are experiencing his love, and so now together we can share in that. And that's why it says in in 1 John 4, no man has seen God at any time. But he says, as we fellowship with one another, we experience his love is perfected in us. As we abide in him together, his love is perfected in us. His love is experienced in tangible flesh and blood ways when the other day Don and I had lunch and we're talking about real life struggles that we both have and there's no there's no condemnation. It's just, hey, I get it, man. I got my own. And wow, is this amazing who God is and that he loves us and that he's for us despite all these things. I mean, in those experiences, we are experiencing God's grace in reality. And he's creating this atmosphere. And we've been experiencing it at our church and we are looking forward to more of it. It's a community of love. It's a community of transparency where we can be honest. James says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. We can literally talk about anything and everything. I was, with, uh, I was officiating a wedding last night and talking with some church folks who were there at the wedding and during the reception. And uh, One of my friends up there who, who's a pastor on staff at a church up in Lakewood, he just said, hey, how do you, like, he's talking about how do you foster an environment of this counseling thinking, of practical theology, of, of the Bible like connecting with real life struggles. How do you foster that? And he says, and, and this counseling that's going on, he's like, let me ask you, are you, are you counseled? I said, yeah, I need counseling just as much as everybody I meet with. And I said, and so do you. And I said, let me tell you what that looks like. And I told about my conversations with Don and Greg and David and, and the input that I get from my brothers that I need desperately to help me see clearly. I said, absolutely I do. And then we had this great conversation about things that we're hopeful for in terms of what God is doing in the church and more and more acquainting all of his people with the, the ugly realities that we've worked so hard to kind of sweep under the rug, to kind of avoid, ignore. And so we talked about facing them and, and how real life grace is this awesome Thing. So a community of love, community of transparency, to be able to talk about those things, a community of help, to help one another when the time comes, whether that's through speaking truth or whatever, helping each other move practically, you know, whatever that looks like, variety of possibilities. So I hope that... Um, as we continue through Exodus and we keep seeing this God on the ground rescuing his people, and as we keep talking about these truths in the context of Sunday school, church service, men's meetings on Wednesday mornings in my office, uh, ladies' meetings Tuesday night or Thursdays uh, at Ronnie's house where they do the, the Roman study, I mean, it's always the same thing. It's studying this book, encountering God, and connecting the truths we see here about who our great God is with the real life struggles and honesty, a mutual sense of encouragement, and this awareness that until we're home, it's going to be simultaneous realities. Death and life, sinner and saint, you name it, and, and God is teaching us things about himself as we walk through life with those two sort of dual realities. 
That's all I have. Don, you want to come up? Say a few things? And you can just use uh, your mic there from your stand if you want so we can get this recorded, okay? It's dangerous to ask me to come up. I was jotting down a few notes as Jeff talked there. Um, I wrote down a God who meets us in our mess. This whole concept of real life grace. Uh, I think most of you that have been here, you've, you've, we've, you've heard us talk extensively about uh, this idea of kind of a messy life, the, the reality of being a creature. And, and part of, or one of the main parts of that reality is God created you and I to be in need of help. Let that sink in for a minute. He created you and I to be in really constant need of assistance from him specifically. And what happened in the garden, what we've talked extensively about is we, we've rejected that. that that's, uh, that's ugly. It's uncomfortable. I, I, I want to help myself. And, and each human being resists the just that whole concept of um, needing the help of another. And I think I'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, Jeff was just talking about kind of um, maybe th- just the challenge of uh, recognizing where you are right now and this kind of concept of, hey, what is that one thing in your life right now that you'd like to put in that box and, uh, or that, that one person that you'd like to put in a box and drop off one of those clear-cut cliffs in the Capitol Forest somewhere? Um, I've told this story before, but in some chaplain training that I was doing at Madigan a number of years back, we had to, we had to spend time being an on-call, on on-duty chaplain, and specifically during <clears throat> some of the uh, most, uh, the, the busiest times of the week or the weekend, uh, and specifically in the, for the emergency room, the trauma center. And uh, one of the first times that I experience being an, an on, a chaplain on call there at Madigan, it was a really difficult experience. Um, kid got in a, a motorcycle accident and was in the emergency room, and they, they had to go to extreme measures to include basically opening, not basically, opening up his chest and massaging his heart. And, and this boy passed away, and uh, of course I, I was just in shock as a chaplain um, one of the first times experiencing that. And it kind of set the tone for the rest of the times that I would go in and get the pager to be the on-call chaplain. Uh, that, uh, that was uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable to me. And, and not necessarily ex- seeing that happen to a person, but for me it was then dealing with the parents after. That's what was hard. Uh, the, the, the blood, the, you know, that kind of thing, I, I, I don't know why, but that doesn't necessarily bother me. But it's the grief, it's the... Um, seeing other people experiencing loss in a traumatic way that was difficult for me. And that's uncomfortable, and I, don't, I, I, don't, I still don't like it, even though I know it's part of being a human, part of how God reveals to us our need for him. Uh, but one time I was going in to, uh, on a Friday, which is usually the worst day on the I-5 corridor and what you experience in Madigan, um, and I was going to get the, the pager from the guy that, that had it, and he saw that I was uh, long in the face and kind of shuffling in, into the office. And uh, he, I think he asked some questions about it. And I, I kind of said, ah, yeah, yeah, you, you know, give me the pager. And um, not really looking forward to this. And he handed me the pager and he said, he said, um, may God give you exactly what you need. So here's the crazy thought to piggyback off of what Jeff was saying. If we really believe the theology that we see in Scripture, specifically here at this church, then you have to deal with this. God knows everything. God has created you specifically, yes, for a purpose, and that purpose being for a relationship with him and with other people. And here's the hard part. God has you exactly where he wants you. And he's giving you exactly what you need. 
That's hard when you're talking about a messy life. That's hard when you're looking back or forward on a life that isn't necessarily the life that you might have chosen in a perfect situation. But yet the irony is, and what we believe here, that what gives great hope is not just going, okay, oh, oh well, God, God is giving me what I need, and I just need to gut it out and you know, try to find joy in that. No, it, what's interesting, and, and what somebody had mentioned a few months back in talking about being an artist, that in order to see light and really see the brilliance of it and the reality of it, it's got to be in the contrast or, or contrasted with darkness. You know, that's what he's doing with you and I. He has let us live a life and continues to let us live a life in which we don't really think we need help, or even when we think we need help, we're, we put it in the terms that we want it in. And this whole concept of grace we really have no concept of until it's put in contrast with the reality of life. And now as he shows us, as he exposes us for what we really are, which are creatures in need of him, we actually start to understand what grace is and what hope is and what real peace is and what real freedom is. And all of those are a very different definition according to God than than the definition we assign to it to begin with. I'm beginning to understand peace and freedom and hope in a totally different way than I used to think of it when I was back in seminary preparing to be a preacher. And so this concept of real-life grace and what we've been teaching here has to do with this fact that, that God, he's a God who meets us in our, me- in our mess, like Jeff said. And, and what I wrote down here next is this doesn't play, take place in some religious, mystical vacuum. Or, or what I would say, or in your prayer closet. Which is typically those of us who have been raised in the church and you've been in church for any length of time. There seems to be this idea that, hey, all this neat Christian uh, religious growth and peace and freedom is just this, kind of this mystical stuff that happens like between you and God and your prayer closet. And what we are understanding here at our church is that, sure, it it can happen in a mystical, religious, spiritual, invisible kind of a way, but it specifically happens where the rubber meets the road in this place called a community of help or this church environment in which God has put together a bunch of you messy people that have been redeemed, who have been saved, who have been forgiven, and continue to be forgiven. In a very real way, who who continue to be saved, even though we believe that, hey, you are saved, you are done. In God's eyes, you are one of his children, and he continues to make you one of his children. And you experience a hope and a peace as a result of believing that more and more in a real way. So this idea that, It doesn't happen in a prayer closet. It doesn't happen just between you and God. It happens between other people. So this community of help, a real-life grace community. You know, as a chaplain in the the Army, uh, I'm I'm talking a lot to people who either struggle with suicide or I'm talking with leaders and people who who I'm trying to teach how to deal with people who are struggling with suicide. And one of the things that that I talk about is that everybody wants connection. Ironically, even, even you and I who push that away most or often and want to stay isolated and withdrawn, deep down, we really want to be connected. And part of that connection is this idea that I, I, I want to know and I want to be known. I want a real authentic connection with somebody. And that involves a whole bunch of things like like Jeff just talked. It it involves honesty. It it involves transparency. It involves no condemnation. A real connection to to know and be known. And and this verse that uh, I I think Jeff mentioned, it's been radical to me in in Galatians 6.1 where Paul says, bear one another's burdens and in so doing you fulfill the law of Christ. 
And we've drawn a graph here that there's this invisible, spiritual, even mystical relationship with God that really is between you and God. He has you on whatever that path is between you and him. The conversations that you have between you and him are between you and him. So there's that invisible relationship. But then he encourages us in this community of help to be in relationship with a real live human being in which we actually experience that connection to know and be known. And, and what we believe uh, in, in 1 John is that no, nobody's ever really seen God in his fullness and in his glory and his power and his majesty like that. But then he says we have seen God through the love that, that he creates through the connection that we have with each other. So we've been teaching that for years now, really, here at this church. And it continues to be this vision that we, we want to be a part of a church that it truly is a community of help. And it's the way that we're, we're functioning. It's the way that a lot of us are functioning together in this, uh, this new way of relating in which uh, we're connecting with each other, we're knowing each other, we're being known in an authentic way where we're able to begin to experience this strange thing in which God says, confess your sins one to another, and in the process you'll experience a healing that God gives. So we're functioning in that way. We've, we've explained, Jeff has explained to you that um, in, in a very, I, I don't even know how, for how long this, is, this has happened, but um, other churches are treating us, uh, treating Jeff and I in this church as kind of, the, the counselor church, the church in which they, they seek help with, with some of the people that, uh, that need help in their church. Uh, increasingly, churches are asking for training as to, hey, how, how do you understand how, how this whole idea of community of help works? So, so we're beginning to function in that way now where we're, we're having the opportunity to, to train other churches. And this community of help involves something that, that I am seeing as really dynamic action, that a community of help isn't just a a philosophy or some theology that, again, is invisible. It's actually this idea of real-life grace is practical living, practical action that is helpful to people. And I'm not going to go into explaining everything about that, but with the folks that I'm talking with on a weekly basis that are struggling with addiction, that are struggling with conflict, there's this, again, there's this need, there's this desire for connection and activity that is helpful for them. So um, we've talked about creating a, a biblical counseling center, a, a, a counseling training center. Um, we might call it a relationship training center. Uh, who knows what we're going to call it? And, and I am talking in kind of some vague generalities, but we've had this idea for a counseling center um, for, for many years now. I mean, mo- probably five plus years and we are taking action to create that out of our church. Really, it's because of the way that we're already functioning. So it's not really a build it and they will come. It's something that we're already doing. And it's a way that we see how all of us can relate to each other. So that's something that we're going to explore more or work towards in this upcoming year. But along with that, there, there's another conversation that Jeff and I have had together and with many people in the church that isn't, isn't new to everybody but it is this, this, this question that says, hey, we are, we're out here literally in the woods in this beautiful, relaxing place. And the more that we're passionate about this mes- message that we have, this way that we're relating to each other and with each other, the way that we're being used in a good way by people in the community, what, if anything, is maybe a, what is our responsibility as it pertains to um, making this message available to more people. And not just the message, but making this center, this idea of a community of help. Do we have a responsibility to make that known to more people, to make that available to more people? You know, most people would look at our church out here in the woods of, basically we have probably an, an, an average attendance on a Sunday of about 60 to tops 80 people. Most evangelical pastors would say that's a dying church. Now, if you look at our demographics, it's not dying because it's the opposite of most 
60 to 70 member churches and that we have about 50 some tiny little kids and a whole bunch of young families. So it's actually an alive church. I mean, it's encouraging on that aspect. But still, we're, we're generally small. And that's okay. We've been, we've been content with that. I've been content with that. But there is this question of, uh, and there's been, a const- there's been some feedback from people consistently about uh, being in town, moving to, a pl- to an actual uh, neighborhood, and having a dynamic uh, community of help within a, within a neighborhood, within a community. And we've talked about that for years. We've gotten feedback from people. Um, and I, we, we're going to explore that more over the course of this next year. And that can involve all kinds of things. I, I, being in the guard, I have the unique op- opportunity to be first in line to something. And there's the Tumwater Readiness Center that is being built in Tumwater. Uh, and I've, I've recently talked to the folks that are in charge of that. Uh, we, we can move in there and, and be a church there in a way of exploring what it's like being in a community. And, I, and we say that, spe- that community specifically because Jeff and I, our families, we're, we're embedded in Tumwater in coaching with the kids and the schools that they're going to, with the people that we're connected with, with the folks that, that you know, we believe God is using... Um, as a ministry, too, that aren't even at this church, but that God is still using us in, in their lives. Um, so we're embedded in the Tumwater community, and we would like to explore what it would be like to, to be a church in a, in a community that, that is a, that, that's not to say that the Lake community is not a community, but it's a small community. I think there's other ways we can explore how to, how to be vibrant within this, this community also. Uh, but the reality is uh, this theme has been coming up often. And it, it is part of what Jeff and I believe is a calling in our own hearts. How do we, how do we minister to? How do we, how do we perhaps take this idea of a community of help and this message of real-life grace to a community of people that is very large that needs to hear this message and needs to see this message? So we would like to explore that this year. And, uh, I, and I think that we can do that in a way that um, is very uh, low to no risk, um, that may uh, create some excitement um, from people here in this church that are in that community and even outside of this community. And I'm not giving a lot of specifics, one, because we don't have them. Um, basically, that's a, a year plus down the road, so it gives a timeline that, that allows us to talk about that, to answer questions to explore what that would look like, uh, explore what it looks like here uh, with our facility and the church, what, what that means for, for kind of the here and now. Um, and part of the way that I'm presenting this is because we, we want to solicit, uh, solicit the conversation from you. Concerns, ideas, excitement, uh, whatever that would look like. Um, but I... I envision, whether it's here or somewhere else, I envision a church and a community of help that is vibrant all week long, not just on Sunday, not just on uh, a couple of days a week, but to be using our resources, our facility, our people in a way that truly is a ministry to, to our community, to our neighborhoods, uh, wherever you are and wherever our facility is. Uh, and, and I'm excited about that. And, and probably part of this, too, can be that uh, you're going to experience Jeff and I at the, at the prime of our lives, and we're experiencing midlife crises. So in, in, uh, in all of the leadership training that I've gotten, and I've gotten the best of the best from the military, regardless of what your view of that is, I have, I have received the top training of, of, of leadership and strategy at the military level. And there is this idea of dynamic change, even infusing change, even when it doesn't seem necessary, in order to spur, uh, spur conversation, spur activity, spur uh, even conflict as a means of, in what we view here at this church, as a means of connecting of being revealed as people in need of each other's help. 
as people that, that God is giving uh, greater portions of compassion and empathy for the people around us that spurs activity. So that's just brief. That's in brief uh, what our vision is for 2019. Um, Jeff, do you want me to pr- close this in prayer? And Yeah. Um, so one last thing, uh, as Don, and I forget to say this earlier, but he said we're already functioning that way. I mean, that is true. We did the Real Life Grace Counseling Workshops, two of them this past year. Well, I had several meetings with the guys at Westwood Baptist. The next one's going to be hosted there. They've got a lot of people they want to run through that. Other churches in the area, Reality Church, Paul Jones is pastor over there. I've talked to him. He wants to send people. Uh, there are a number of connections we have, and we already have plans of some of these workshops. So as Don said, I just want you to know, it, it is happening. And so we're just trying to see and navigate, okay, in the next year, let's explore this location issue for our footprint, and let's prayerfully do that. So we'll, we'll keep you informed. We'll be in touch. I think maybe to a fault sometimes we, we want to err on the side of transparency, relational ministry. So we're going to be talking about that as the year goes, okay? And anytime you have questions, come, come talk to us, okay? Uh, let me pray, all right? Father, thank you that we could have this time this morning. Thank you for the incarnation of Jesus, him coming to our world on this rescue mission. Thank you that we get to be the people who have been rescued by him. And, uh, and as Don said, we live in, in communities in which people need, need that message. They need that truth. They, they don't need more uh, carrots to chase, more fantasies. They need reality, and they need Jesus meeting them in reality. And so if you would use us to, to help present your truth, your gospel in those contexts, God, we, we are excited about that and what you'll do. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for the, the leadership team of our church, the conversations we've had. Uh, pray for the year ahead that uh, we, would, we would navigate through in a, in a way that we gain uh, clarity and have mutual understanding and work, even the Don says, as we work through the conflict, God, that you're over all of it. You're working for good in all of it. And that we would be driven back over and over and over again to your great love for us through Christ. Uh, Even as Greg says, uh, our relationship with people drives us to God. And our relationship with God drives us back to people. So Lord, you you, um, keep keep doing that in our lives and we'll trust you for that. Uh, Thank you again for everyone who's here this morning. Thank you for our visitors being here. I hope they've been encouraged, Lord, and and, uh, know that you're working their lives as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.